Good morning. Welcome to St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, where again we have opportunity to gather around the means of grace today in both word and in sacrament. For the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, we're reminded today that for every Christian, our whole life is a win-win situation. The worst case scenario is that we die, but we know that through our Savior Jesus, that means we go to be with him forever in heaven. So that's not the worst case, that's the best case. Perhaps the worst case scenario is that we live for a long time in suffering and pain, and we know that even then, in Christ, we have an opportunity to serve him and share his grace with others. To live is Christ and to die is gain. It is a win-win for every believer. We'll hear more about it in our lessons and in our sermon this morning. This morning we'll be using the service of word and sacrament. It's printed for you in its entirety in the worship folder. And we'll begin with our opening hymn of praise, Though Thoughtless Thousands Choose. We ask God to be with us and to bless the service this morning. I invite you to stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, 
words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We pray for God's continued mercy. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy. Hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. be seated. We may not always understand the Lord's ways, why he takes someone young in life to go be with him in glory while he lets someone else linger for decades in suffering and in pain. But whether we understand his ways or not, because they are higher than our ways, his thoughts so much greater than ours, nevertheless we can trust him because we know that those who seek the Lord always find forgiveness. They always find his mercy. First lesson is from Isaiah chapter 55, beginning at the sixth verse. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. 
and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. We continue our service this morning with the psalm of the day. We'll sing together in unison Psalm 27 as it's found on the back of your worship folder. In our second lesson, the Apostle Paul reminds the Philippians and us that to live is Christ and to die is gain. For every Christian, it is a win-win. Our second lesson from Philippians chapter 1 will also serve as our sermon text for this morning. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed and will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, Your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, 
I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. While one believer may serve Jesus for only a short amount of time and then be called home to glory, and another believer might be asked to serve our Savior for decades of suffering in this sin-filled world, at the end, no one can accuse Jesus of being unfair in how we were called to work for him. The only way we can call him unfair is in his grace, that he does not give us what we deserve. Instead, he is generous with us. That's the reminder our Savior gives to his disciples and to us in our gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 20. I invite you to stand now out of respect for the words of our Savior. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? For the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. may be seated as we continue our service with the hymn of the day. We'll sing, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text chosen for today is our epistle reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Dear fellow redeemed. Many years ago, I remember a sermon that one of my pastors preached when I was still in high school. And he talked about the hospital visits he had made that particular week. In the same day, he had visited two different people. The first one was an elderly woman who, as he began to give the devotion, broke down in tears and said, Pastor, why does the Lord make me continue to live here? I have lived so many years. I have aches and pains. I've suffered so long. I'm lonely. Why does God make me stay here? I long so to be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in heaven. Well, from there, he went to visit another person in the hospital, a young mother who had been diagnosed with a serious and very aggressive form of cancer. And they told her she only had a short time to live. And she broke down in tears also. And she said, Pastor, why has the Lord stricken me with this illness? Why is God going to cause me to die? I'm going to have to leave my children behind all alone and my husband why is the Lord doing this to me? Why does he not allow me to continue to live? Well, the response that the pastor gave to those two women, responses, I should say, were quite different, and yet exactly the same. Because you see, St. Paul had already answered those questions long ago when he said, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is the title of our message for this morning, as we are reminded what it means to live and what it means to die in Christ. Now, our text begins, but what does it matter? And we ask, what does what matter? We need some context to understand what Paul is talking about. Well, we need to go back quite a ways and rewind. St. Paul first went to the city of Philippi <clears throat> because of the Macedonian call. He and his traveling companion Silas were waiting for God's revelation to know what to do next, and St. Paul had a dream that there was a man of Macedonia beckoning to Paul and saying, come and preach the gospel to us. So Paul and Silas sailed for Philippi. Now Philippi, compared to other cities around it, was a relatively young city, about 350 years old, which is still more than twice as old as New Alm, but at that time, Philippi had a population of about 350,000 people, about the size of Madison, Wisconsin. So it was a large, bustling city, but there was no synagogue in Philippi. And that's usually the place where St. Paul started when he went into a town to preach the gospel. Since there was no synagogue, however, he searched around and ended up by the edge of the river, <clears throat> where there was a group of women who were holding an outdoor worship service. And the Bible says that St. Paul preached the gospel and that one of those who was listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. <clears throat> And it says that she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, we hear in the Bible. Not that she made her decision for Christ, but the Lord opened her heart to believe. And when she became a believer, she asked Paul and Silas to come to her home, and she had all of the members of her household baptized, and then offered her home as a place where Paul and Silas could have their headquarters while they preached the gospel in Philippi. So Paul began to evangelize. But as he began to preach about Jesus, a slave girl began to follow him around. And the old King James Version says she had a familiar spirit. The NIV says an unclean spirit. But the Greek literally says she had the spirit of the python. 
And if you know Greek mythology, you may know that Python, or Pythia, was a snake-like monster, according to their myth, who ruled the underworld. But Apollo, the sun god, fought and killed Pythia and took Pythia's underground temple and made it his own. And in Greece, there is a place in Delphi where there is such an underground temple where priestesses used to serve. And according to the myth, Apollo appointed the women who were there serving as priestesses to be his fortune tellers or oracles. And there really was such a place. And many famous people in history went to the oracle at Delphi to have their fortunes told. People like Alexander the Great or Leonidas, the leader of the Spartans, or even in uh, St. Paul's Day, Nero, the Roman Empire. The women would go into the caverns and they would sit and uh, subterranean gases would come up from the floor and they would go into a narcotic trance, drug-induced, gas-induced. They would begin to babble and they were considered to be uh, people who could actually tell a fortune. But the Bible tells us that there was a little bit more to it than just subterranean gas. The Bible tells us that the women in that temple were demon-possessed. They had the spirit of the python. In other words, the devil himself had possessed them. And we are told that this little slave girl in Philippi also had the same demon as they had in Philippi. And she followed Paul and Silas around for several days and said, These men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. But she wasn't talking about the Lord Jehovah when she said the Most High God. She was talking about Zeus. And finally, St. Paul turned around and rebuked the evil spirit in her in the name of Jesus Christ, and it had to leave. And when the slave owners of the little girl realized that she no longer had a demon and no longer had supernatural powers, they became very angry at Paul. And they had St. Paul and Barnabas, or not Barnabas, but rather Silas, beaten and thrown into a jail without any trial. And they were put in the inner cell and they had chains on their arms. But the Bible says even though they were chained up and wounded, at midnight they began to sing hymns of praise to God. And everyone in the jail heard them. And suddenly there was an earthquake. And the chains fell off their arms, and the doors fell off their hinges. And the Philippian jailer was about to kill himself because he knew that it would be his life for the life of any escaped prisoner. But Paul and Silas called out to him and said, Don't harm yourself, we're still here. The jailer came in trembling and asked the most important question that anyone can possibly ever ask. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they gave him the answer to that most important question. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And that's what happened. Not only did the Philippian jailer become a believer as a result, but he took Paul and Silas to his home, washed their wounds, gave them a meal, and had them baptize all the members of his house. The next day, Paul was released from prison. And he left, but it would not be long before he would be arrested and imprisoned again, this time in Rome. And that was the place from whence St. Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians. No doubt as he was in jail, he was thinking about being in jail in Philippi, and he wanted to encourage those people, and he wrote them a letter. He also wrote several others. But as Paul was in Rome, and this is where our text really begins, Paul was there because he was preaching the gospel, and there were people who had already been in Rome before Paul who were preaching the gospel there. And so when some of them heard that Paul had come to Rome and that he had been arrested for preaching the gospel, it emboldened them and gave them even more zeal to preach. Because if Paul would go through that for the sake of Jesus' name, they were willing to do it also. 
But Paul says, there were also some, very sadly, who when they heard that I was in Rome, became envious. After all, they were there first, and they were the ones who were preaching the gospel of Jesus. And now the great famous apostle Paul was coming to Rome, and he was going to steal all their glory. Boy, did they have it wrong. But it's a, remember, it's a reminder that even among us called workers, there can be professional jealousy. And we can have our petty quirks and idiosyncrasies that are, uh, that are antagonized by the sinful nature and by the devil. But Paul said, yeah, it is true. He said there's two kinds of people here among the Christians. There are those who preach Christ out of a pure heart and they really want to advance the kingdom of God. But there are also some who are preaching the gospel sort of to spite me. We can preach the gospel, but you're stuck in jail and, you know, it was kind of that type of thing. But here's what Paul said, and this is where our text begins. He said, but what does it matter? He said, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that's how he speaks of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, he says, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. St. Paul says, you know, the most important thing is that we are preaching God's word and its truth and purity, that we proclaim the gospel of Christ. Forget about the pettiness. Forget about the jealousy. Focus on Christ. Focus on what he has done for you and me, that he lived and died for us, and proclaim that message to the world. Paul said, For to me, live is Christ, and to die is gain. Yes, Paul found himself in a difficult situation, between a rock and a hard place. For Paul realized how many times he had been arrested, how many times he had been beaten, how many times he had been ridiculed, persecuted for the name of Christ. And he knew that eventually he was going to be martyred for Jesus' name. And as he sat in jail in Rome and thought about all of that, he said, you know, I, I'm in a dilemma. Is it better to remain here on earth and to keep on living or to die and be with Christ? And it's sort of like the account that I told you at the beginning of this sermon where there is the elderly woman who asks, why do I have to keep living? I want to die and be with my Lord in heaven. And the young mother who says, why am, do I have to die? I want to be here with my children and my husband and I want to live out the rest of my life on earth. What is better, to live or to die? Well, St. Paul says, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I mean fruitful labor for me. He said, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul says, it's really a no-brainer if I'm really just thinking about myself. I'd rather die and be with Jesus and be in heaven, free from all the pain and the sorrow and the persecution and everything else that comes with it. Who would not want to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ? After all, many years even before St. Paul was born, King Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And if you read that book, you see that Solomon says, I had it all. Wine, women, and song. I had all the food I could eat, all the wine I could drink. I had all the music I could listen to. I had horses. I had silver. I had gold. I had land. There was nothing I withheld from myself. He said, I tested it all. But in the end, we go to bed and sleep. We wake up in the morning. We go to work. We eat and drink. We come back home. We go to bed. We get up in the morning. We work, we eat and drink, we then go to bed, go to sleep, get up. Same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. And he says, the wind blows on its circuit, returns the way that it came. The sun rises, the sun sets, and there it is again. 
And he said, when I take all of this into account and I analyze it from a human standpoint, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. Until God enters into the equation. And then when Solomon takes a step back and he says, I realize this came from the hand of God and now it has meaning, now it has purpose. And he comes to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes and he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. You want to know why God created us? God created us to have fellowship with him. God created us to serve him as his loving children and to do so in joy and to enjoy the presence of the Lord. Paul said the same thing. If it's all about just living on earth and about my own accomplishments, then I really have no reason to be here. But Paul says there is something more to it all. Paul says I need to stay here because I need to continue to proclaim the gospel, to preach to those who do not yet know Jesus, and to strengthen the faith of those who do. Oh, Paul was not so arrogant that he thought he was the one and only person who could preach the gospel. But he, he was reminded of how Jesus Christ chose him specifically to be the evangelist to the Gentiles. And how, although God could have chosen anybody else, God used him specifically. And he said, I believe God is going to continue to use me in that way until the day that he decides to call me home. He says, because... To live is Christ, but to die is gain. What does it mean to die in Christ? Paul says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Now, if I were to ask the average person on the street, uh, is what's better, life or death? Well, they'd all say, well, life is better. After all, as I pointed out a couple of weeks ago in my sermon, death really is a curse. It's the direct result of sin. But at the same time, St. Paul realized that death really meant life for him. Life in the fullest sense that God intended for us. You know, you might think of the fact that death is a curse. But you can also think of the cross. You know, back in Jesus' day and shortly before Jesus' time, when the Romans took things over, and the world was under Roman jurisdiction, the cross was an implement of death. As a matter of fact, it was invented, if you will, for the death of the most heinous criminals to literally torture them to death in the worst possible way. It would be today like having in front of this church an electric chair or a hangman's noose. And people would walk in and say, well, you people are really sick. Why would you have that implement of death as the symbol for your church? Well, it's because everything that Jesus Christ touched was never the same afterward. After he was nailed to the cross and he died for our sin there and paid the debt for us, suddenly the cross was no longer an implement of death. Now it is the symbol of our salvation. In the same way, when Jesus Christ was put in the grave, once he touched the grave and once he touched death, it was no longer the same. Because he took away the sting of death by taking away our sin. And through his forgiveness, we found peace with God. And the grave, which once served as the open jaws of death to engulf the sinner and take them to hell, suddenly became the gates of paradise for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as his or her Lord and Savior. Because that's what Jesus came to do. He came to live the perfect life we couldn't live and to die on the cross for our sin. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. We know that heaven awaits us. Heaven is for real. Not because of the little yellow book about the little boy who claimed that he went there and came back, but because the Bible says so. 
So great is our consolation in Jesus, St. Paul said to the Philippians. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, live a life worthy of the gospel. That word worthy in Greek is the word axios, from which we get our English word, the axis, the balancing point. He says, your life needs to balance out with Jesus. And there's only way, one way that can happen, and that is through the gospel. That Jesus Christ justified us in the sight of God by putting his own righteousness to our credit. And now that we know that, St. Paul says, go back to the gospel. Make that the glue that cements you together and unifies you and causes you as one man to have faith in Christ and to serve him. Today we all have the same dilemma as Paul, don't we? Oh, death may not be looming right on the horizon for everyone here, but for some of you it may be. But I think that all of us probably know someone recently who was taken away from us. I had an aunt. I had an uncle who was my godfather. I knew a number of friends. And even here in St. John's, there were some who were called home. And we realize that we are all very mortal. Even the President of the United States is mortal. But in the end, we who trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior do not have to worry about it. Because if the life we live, we live by faith in Jesus. And the death we die, we die in faith. To us, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we would normally take a collection, but since we are not passing plates, please be reminded that there is a receptacle in the narthex where you can place your offerings if you haven't done so already. You may do it as you leave. If you are at home uh, watching online or on television, then please be reminded that you can either mail in your offerings to the church address or you can bring them to the church office during business hours Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. till 1 p.m. Or you can talk to your bank about automatic withdrawal to send uh, your offering directly to church. With that, we continue with the prayer of the church at the bottom of page 5 of the worship folder. In the prayer of the church, we will also offer a prayer of intercession on behalf of those uh, in civil authorities, especially for our president who has fallen ill with COVID. We pray. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives.
Lord God, ruler of all, we commend our nation and its leaders to your care. We ask especially that you would bless our president as he has fallen ill. If it is your will, restore his health and quickly. We pray also for the members of Congress and all officials who serve us in state, county, and local governments. Impress on all who are in authority the sacredness of the responsibility you have placed on them. Give them the gifts required for leadership, wisdom to make laws that will bring order and justice to our society, and compassion for the downtrodden and the poor. Purge our land from dishonesty and corruption in government, and teach us to honor all civil authorities as your representatives. And through stable government, provide throughout our land an atmosphere in which your church can do its work in peace. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, and the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
may be seated. I invite you to stand as we sing our thanks to God. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. seated. The only announcement that we have to highlight is that our Thursday uh, Bible classes are still ongoing. We've had some glitches with the Thursday night Bible class, but we think we've got them all figured out now. So feel free to join us on Thursday online at 1030 a.m. for Revelation or for uh, the topic of angels at 7 p.m. You can find the link to that in the worship folder insert where you can find all of the other announcements as well. We'll also try and remember to email out the link to you along with the handouts that we will have for that Bible class. May you go rejoicing that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And God be with you, dear friends, until we meet again.